you're doing well today. This is T.J. Gifford with the Lake City Church of Christ. Let me say once again how thankful we are that you have chosen to join us as we study the Bible, God's Word, together. Go ahead and take out your Bibles and be turning with me to James chapter 2. That is James chapter 2, and we're going to study verses 14 through the end of the chapter. That's our goal, is James 2, verses 14 through verse 26. Let me also just say that if you are joining us, and if it's convenient for you, go ahead and leave your name or a comment in the comment section below. We'd love to know that you are joining us. Now, I talk to so many people who say I'm not able to do that, but just know that we're listening and we hear you, and we're so very thankful that you have chosen to study with us on Wednesday nights. Let me also say that if you're not a member of the Lake City Church of Christ and you want to know more about our congregation of God's people, please feel free to reach out to me, T.J. Gifford, or message us on our Facebook page, and we'd love to have a conversation with you about what we stand for and what we're about. We have some good programs that we're proud of. If you're in the Lake City community and you know someone who needs help with food, send them our way on Thursdays. Now, it's different times each Thursday, but this Thursday, we will be handing out food at our church building beginning at 3 in the afternoon. We hope that you will send someone our way so we can get to know them and help them in their time of need. Okay, the book of James has been a good study so far, at least it has been for me. I hope you are enjoying it as well. And as we have studied the first half of James chapter 2, we now make our way into the second half of that chapter. And in this last half of James 2, he talks about the important subject of faith and works. You see, church family, ladies and gentlemen, we're sometimes told by people that we think are pretty smart religiously, who people we think know their Bibles pretty well, that faith and works are always at odds with one another. And certainly sometimes that's the case. It just depends on what type of works is under consideration. For instance, in Galatians 2 and verse number 16, he says that we are not justified by works of the law. And so works of the law, works under the Old Testament system, does not save us under the New Testament system. And for instance, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says we are not saved by works of our own merit, is in essence what he's saying there. In other words, I personally am not good enough to work my way to heaven. And so, yes, in those two instances, works, those type of works, and faith are at odds. But when we come to James chapter 2, he talks to us about a type of works that, that does work perfectly and seamlessly with faith, and actually without faith, then, or without works, however, faith is not complete. Now, let's jump right into the reading of the text. The Bible says in James 2 and verse number 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? And so the very first verse we see that James is asking a question. God, through inspiration, is asking us a question, actually two questions, but it's summarized in one question, and that is, can faith without work save us? That's the question. Now, there's a large portion of modern Christianity, and I put that word Christianity in quotes, that would have you and I to believe that, yes, you can be saved by faith, but not necessarily by works. And actually what they mean by this word faith is, is the idea of accepting a, a truth or accepting a fact. That is mentally accepting that God is real, that Jesus is His Son, that, that Jesus offers salvation. I accept that mentally. I'm going about my life, therefore I have faith. You'll see as this chapter unfolds, friends, that that is not God's complete definition of faith. That is such a partial, weak definition of faith and so we ask the question, can faith, can mental acceptance alone save us when works or actions or obedience is not accompanied with it? And of course that word obedience or that word works simply means obedience to the will of God. So that's the question. In verses 15 and 16, he gives us an inspired illustration that I find interesting. He says, okay, here's the question, can faith apart from works save us of our sins? 
Before he goes on to answer that question, he gives us an illustration. He says this in verse 15, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, underline it. He says, What does it profit? Now, in essence, what he's saying in verses 15 and 16 is this. He's saying that if we have faith without works, it's a whole lot like a person coming to our door, knocking on it in the middle of the winter, and we get up from our dining room table in our warm, cozy home, eating a warm, home-cooked meal, and we go to the front door, and we open the door, and the person on the other end of that door is frail and weak and sick. And they're hungry and they're cold. They are in need of food. They are in need of, of health care. They are in need, if you will, of something warm to wear. And we say to that person, I see that you're hungry. That's obvious. And I see that you're cold. You're shivering. And I probably use a checkup, a, a medical checkup at the moment. But you know what? I believe that you're sick. I believe that you're poor. I believe that you're hungry and cold. I believe that you're in need. Sir, have a good day. And we shut the door. Does acknowledging the person's needs help them one bit? And of course the answer is no, it doesn't help one bit. And so James uses this illustration to say, if that doesn't work in that scenario, why then would we think that faith without active obedience is any faith at all? And so... That's the point that he makes. And then, again, the question, verse number 14, can we be saved with a mental acceptance type of faith apart from works and obedience? Can we? He goes on to answer that question in some detail in verse number 17 when he says this, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, underline it, folks, it is dead. What James is telling you and I is that we may accept that God is real and we may accept, mentally accept that Jesus is his son and he died on the cross for our sins and he wants us to go to heaven. We may accept mentally all of that, but at the end of the day, if we do not have active obedience to accompany that, the faith we have is a dead faith. Now that's not my words, folks. That is the words of James 2 and verse number 17. And so it is possible to believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ and yet have a faith that is inactive, a faith that is not living, a faith that is indeed dead. And a dead faith can do none of us any good. That's what James 1 is, or James 2 is saying. In James 2 and verse number 18, he offers another illustration of, of sorts. He says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. He says, show me your faith without your works, and then I'll go ahead and show you my faith by my works. Let's imagine for a moment that your family decided to build a home. You're going to build a house. You've been saving. You've been planning. You've been pondering it. You've been dreaming. You've been wishing. You finally found a set of land, and you're about to build a home. But you know you've got to find some contractor to build it for you, so you narrow it down to two individuals, two builders in the community. And you talk to the first man who says, I, who wants to build your home, and he says, here's a notebook full of homes that I've built right here in this community. Home after home, page after page after page, picture after picture after picture. Not only that, but he tells us where all of these homes are located. And we drive by, and, and house after house after house, we see his craftsmanship. We see the proof of, of what he is claiming, that he's not only building homes, but he's building good homes, and he's building structurally sound homes, and so the proof is in the pudding. He's not just claiming but he has some evidence, some proof to back it up. And so that's guy number one. Guy number two comes along and he claims to be a great builder. He claims to be the best builder in all the community. You ask him, where, where's the homes that you've built? And he says, well, we've been thinking about it and planning about it and talking about it for years, but we've actually not yet built a home. There's no place to drive by and see a home that I've built because it doesn't exist. There's no book or catalog that I can show you showing you all of my craftsmanship because it doesn't exist. And so I promise you I can build you a better home than man number one, but you've just got to blindly trust me. 
Folks, where's the proof in that? In essence, James is saying, will you go ahead and show me your faith without any proof? And I'll then come behind you and show you my faith, and you don't have to wonder about what's in my heart because you see it on the outside. You see what I do. You see who I help. You see the works that I'm involved in. In essence, God, though he can see our heart, and it's important what's in our heart, no doubt. He looks down and he judges us based on our heart and how that manifests itself through outward obedient actions. And so if I try to convince myself that saying I'm a Christian and, and saying it loudly and telling everyone I know about, if that alone makes me a, good, a faithful Christian, God is saying, no, you need to have the life and the actions that back it up. That's what he says in verse number 18. Now, if you go down to verse number 19, he says something rather interesting. In James 2 and verse number 19, he says this, and I do find it very interesting. He says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. It's good to mentally accept the truth that God exists and that there is no other gods in all the universe. If you have accepted that, good on you. But he, he kind of brings us back to reality when he says, even the demons believe and tremble. I used to have a sermon some years ago, and the three points were a dead faith, a demonic faith, and a doing faith. And in the sequence of this passage, we're on point number two in the outline that I used some years ago. He's saying, look, if we have a faith that is mental acceptance only without action, it's a dead faith. But he, he acknowledges that the demons have something a little better than a dead faith. They have a mental acceptance in God and the reality of his existence. But then they have emotion attached to that. They tremble at that reality. And I would even add that in the ministry of Jesus, in the Gospels, Jesus on more than one occasion would, would interact with a demon and that demon would outwardly confess that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And so demons believe in the existence of God and the legitimacy of Jesus Christ. They, they, they more than believe that. They have confessed that. They more than believe and confess that. They are emotionally affected by that. And yet certainly we know that the demons will not be saved. Why? Because believing with a degree of emotion is not good enough to have a, act, to, to have a biblical faith. Now think about that. A faith that is only accepting of a certain reality and has some emotion attached to it, that's not good enough, folks. And I want to s suggest to you that that is the typical faith we see in the modern religious world. A whole lot of talk, a whole lot of claiming, a whole lot of emotion, but not a whole lot of obedience to the will of God. If we want our faith to be different if we want our faith to stand apart, we've got to live our faith every day and act it out in our lives from a genuine, sincere place. That's what the Bible is telling us. Now, I just want to say in verse number 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, He's going to use Abraham as an example. And I find this section rather interesting because there's a number of points to be made. In James 2 and verse number 20 and following, he says, <clears throat> But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? He says in verse 22, Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, I read all of that to make these observations. Number one in verse number 20, highlight or underline the word no, K-N-O-W. That word is important. That word is significant. You see, what the Bible is telling us is that we can know for certain, we can be certain in this truth. What truth? That faith without works is dead. 
We can look at the examples, biblical examples, of biblical heroes like in this chapter Abraham and Rahab. But in the case with Abraham, the Bible says he was justified by works. That's not the works of the law. Galatians 2 and verse 16. That's not the works of personal merit that are condemned in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That's the works of obedience to the will of God. For God said to Abraham, Take your son, your only son Isaac, up on the mountain and sacrifice him. And Abraham put his faith in action, and he went up there to sacrifice to offer his son Isaac on the altar. And Abraham had faith, Hebrews 11 tells us, because he trusted so deeply in God that he was willing to, 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 to slay his son, to offer his son, concluding that surely God would raise him from the dead. Faith is trust. We talked about this on Sunday. Faith is trust in the unseen, but it's trust that we have good reason to, to believe in. You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, the evidence of things not seen. Yes, it is. faith is trusting in something we cannot see, but that something we cannot see and trust in, that trust is founded upon a great degree of evidence, giving us good reason to trust in whatever that is, in this case, God. Faith, or trust in this case, notice what the passage says, it works together with works. They are not opposed. They are not like oil and water. It is not the case that we're either living by faith or living by works of obedience. No, not regarding works of active obedience in God's will, but faithfulness, obedience, works of obedience, and true biblical faith, they go hand in hand. They work together. Obedience without faith is worthless. And faith without obedience is worthless. I would say that we trust so deeply in that which we cannot see but have good reason to see that it shows up in the way we live. We're so trusting in those words, the Word of God, that it shows up in our actions. That's what James is suggesting to us here. And then he says something that I find very interesting. He says that works makes our faith complete. Now, that, that's what the word perfect means. By the word perfect, that works makes our faith perfect, not that it makes us, blame, or not that it makes us sinless, it, not that it makes us perfect as in we commit no wrong. No, the word perfect means complete or to its full maturity. And, and so if I really want to have a complete faith, a, a faith that, that really matters and will get me to heaven, then I need to have a faith that is made complete by active obedience, by works of obedience. He goes on to give another example in verse number 25. He says, not only was, was Abraham justified by works of obedience, but also Rahab in verse number 25 was, was justified by works of obedience. Uh, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. And so James is saying all of this, and he concludes it with this grand crescendo in verse number 26 when he says this, and it just sticks with you folks, for as the body without the spirit is dead. Notice, so faith without works is dead also. Don't let Satan fool you folks. Accepting Jesus and the reality of God mentally with no life to back it up, no actions to back it up, it means absolutely nothing. Our faith must be lived out not only on Sunday, but every day of the week. And may we learn from James 2 that Christianity is not a shallow way of living. It is a, it is a genuine, deep-seated way of living that shows up in every facet of our lives, and our faith will be revealed in how we are committed to the cause of Christ in this life. It'll show up in our prayer life. It'll show up in our Bible study. It'll show up in our worship attendance. Those of us who have the ability and the health to be at worship services, it will show up in the excuses we make or don't make. It will show up in our involvement in the local church. It will show up in every aspect of our lives, how we treat our spouse, how we treat our children, how we interact with our co-workers. And the list goes on and on and on. We might be the only Bibles that some people read. Glorify God 
in everything that we do. Folks, I just want to say thank you. We've concluded James chapter 2. I want to say thank you for joining us this evening and studying with us this great passage regarding faith and works. We pray that you and myself alike can apply these truths to our lives, live them out in service to God, and teach them to others also. We hope you have a good week, and if you have the opportunity to come by and visit with us or to attend with us on Sunday at the Lake City Church of Christ, we invite you to do that. We have our first worship service on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we have a second worship service at 6 p.m. We invite you to come and join us. We look forward to meeting you, and until then, God bless.